Well, good afternoon. I'm Jeff Cook. I'm the chairman of the Tennessee Fish and Wildlife Commission. I'd like to welcome everyone to our first day of our two-day April meeting, and I believe we're all here. So, Danette, if you please call the roll. Bill Cox. Yes, ma'am. Connie King. Here. Kent Woods. James Stroud. <coughs> Angie Box. Here. Jamie Woodson. Tony Sanders, Here. Bill Swan, Here. Dennis Gardner, Here. Chad Baker, Here. Brian McLaren, Here. Kurt Holbert, Here. Jeff Cook, Here. Kent Woods. I said that. Okay. Chairman, we have a quorum. Thank you, Danette. And James did James make it. Oh, James Basically. drowned it. Okay. <laughs> So, yeah, I'd like to welcome everyone here today, and thanks. We have a great crowd today, and it, as usual, anyone that wants to uh, speak from the public, please step to the microphone, state your name, any group you might, uh, where you're from, any group you might represent, and please direct any of your questions or comments toward either me or the chairman of whichever commission is being discussed at that time. And today, we might have some dis quite a bit of discussion, so we're going to do the, the three-minute deal where you have three minutes and Danette will tell us when there's one minute left to sort of wrap things up so and you know, commissioners today is a committee day and so we have our list of uh, committee members on the agenda so we'll stick to that policy as well and uh, I believe that's oh, one other one other, Mike Butler we'd like to congratulate Mike on having the Wildlife Federation uh, Award of America the best Federation in America so we congratulate you on that so So, Director Carter, are there any comments or before we get started? All right, well, we have one other uh, special day today. And uh, Connie, I'd like to wish you a happy birthday. So, happy birthday. So, so, so. We, yeah, we, we, we hope you have a special day today. So, all right. So, with that, we'll turn it over to Chairman Holbert for the Wildlife Committee meeting. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, at this time, I'd like to call on our Assistant Chief, Chuck Yost. Good afternoon, Commissioners. The purpose of this presentation is to preview the proposed hunting season regulations for 2018-19 and also 2019-20 in order for the agency and the commission to receive feedback on them before they are acted upon in May. Not to take away from the significance, <laughs> not to take away from the significance of Commissioner King's birthday, but I, I want to, wanted to introduce you to my new daughter, Charlie. Charlie Louise, who was born on April 14th. So if I appear less polished today than usual, she's my excuse. <laughs> How did that get there? Oh, well, there's just a few. That's my favorite. Anyhow, if I'm going to take you all down, I guess I'll go down with you. So at least I made it in there, too. So the season setting process is a major undertaking for the agency. And um, the, it really begins for us when we begin to solicit public comment for changes to hunting regulations. So we have our hunting seasons, then we solicit public comment. And this year's period was January 15th through February 15th, and the agency received 1,340 comments uh, during this time. And I want to uh, emphasize that once that begins, the agency begins holding meetings where we consider those recommendations as long as those of staff. And it's a pretty intensive process that results in recommendations that will be before you today. But I wanted to say that uh, I'm extremely grateful uh, to, to the public who commented and also to the agency staff uh, that 
that have done the work to get this presentation prepared and then also the development of the recommendations because it, it requires many, many factions of the agency and um, it's a good product. So I'm very proud of it and thank you everyone for your contribution to this presentation. What you're about to hear are the recommended changes Therefore, if a recommendation is not made on a particular subject, it is safe to assume that there's no change being proposed for it. I want to remind you that the agency is working towards standardization of dates as much as we can in proclamation so that we don't have to amend them every year just to account for simple uh, calendar changes. So for the sake of time, we are not presenting those details today. However, they can be uh, reviewed in the proposed uh, proclamations provided to you and then also available to the public. Once hunting regs are passed at the May Commission meeting, those calendar dates will be published in the Annual Hunting Guide and on the website to inform hunters and the general public. A bit of a caveat for today, because the agency doesn't know the outcome of its statewide agency recommendations at this point, for example, if there was a proposed change regarding the deer hunting regulations, we have not gone ahead and accounted for those in the, in the WMA proc. This is, this is to prevent confusion for today and to not undergo a lot of additional effort not knowing if those recommendations will come to fruition but it's just a matter of housekeeping if they do. So we'll take care of that between now and May or following the decisions at the May meeting. We're gonna, we're gonna cover recommendations regarding falconry, big game, wildlife management areas, and national wildlife refuges. As a result of including falconry, there will not be a second presentation today by J Jamie Federson as indicated on the agenda. So we'll take care of all the Wildlife Committee matters uh, in the next little bit during this presentation. And uh, in a moment, I will, I will introduce Jamie Federson, the Migratory Game Bird Program Leader, to address the three procl proclamations regarding falconry. Jamie will be followed by a host of speakers to address the other proclamations which will establish the other hunting regulations for upcoming seasons. Keep in mind the National Wildlife Refuge PROC is more of a formality in that the agency presents hunting regs for partner-owned properties for commission passage, passage. In addition to presenting on regulation recommendations, the big game program leaders will also provide a summary of the results of the recent hunting seasons to better inform your decision making. At the end of the big game presentations, I will return to the podium to invite a break in the action before moving on to the WMA and NWR proclamations. And one last FYI, we are deferring to the Boating and Law Enforcement Committee for manners and means topics such as bear tagging, use of air bows, guns, etc. Uh, speakers during this committee meeting, the Wildlife Committee, have been asked to defer discussion on these items to the next committee meeting. And with that, I'll ask Jamie Federson to come up and, and kick us off. Thank you. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, Commissioners. Today I'm going to be previewing proclamations 18-02, uh, Migratory Game Bird Hunting Seasons and Regulations, Proclamation 18-03, Statewide Fur Bearer Hunting and Trapping Seasons and Bag Limits, Proclamation 18-04, uh, Statewide Small Game Hunting Seasons and Bag Limits. And so specifically within these um, proclamations, I'm going to address the addition of seasons and bag limits for hunting with raptors. Uh, which is more commonly referred uh, to as falconry. Currently, raptor or hunting with raptor seasons uh, for migratory game birds, fur bearers, and small game are collectively addressed in Proclamation 91-15. And if you know anything about proclamations, the first two numbers are the year in which the proclamation was signed. 
and it's been a while since we've looked at raptor the falconry hunting so um, we um, we did some review with our legal uh, law enforcement and wildlife and forestry division staff and and determined it was more appropriate to have the the season dates and bag limits that were set up in this proclamation 91-15 uh, to be put into other proclamations they'd be um, it, they were more suited to be in other locations. And so now we're going to include take with raptors in our manner and means uh, proclamation. And we're going to take the season dates and bag limits information um, and include them in the appropriate species proclamations. We'll, we're gonna use generic season date language where it's appropriate. And we're gonna make sure that we uh, put all of the actual season dates and bag limits on in our hunting guide and on our website. So I'm gonna start out with uh, migratory game birds. And as you all know, the frameworks for uh, hunting migratory game birds is set by the Fish and Wildlife Service. And uh, hunting seasons with falcon or with raptors is no exception. Um, Falconers are allowed a total of 107 days uh, of hunting for each migratory game bird species. Uh, and so this, inc this, this includes all of the established hunt gun hunting days as well. So as an example, using ducks, um, a falconer can take their bird and hunt during the nine days in September for wood, duck, and teal. They can, they can use their birds during the 60 days of the regular waterfowl season that the gun hunters have they can hunt their birds on the two youth days as well and that totals up to 71 days so they have an additional 36 days that they can fly their birds um, so while they've got a, a bigger window uh, of days that they can hunt they have a smaller bag limit in which they um, to, to, to kind of offset some things and so they're only allowed um, three birds of any migratory game bird species singly or in the aggregate, meaning they can only harvest three migratory game birds in a day. And it's not, not per species, collectively. Not only are we moving language from one proclamation to another, we also decided to include language that better defines season dates and bag limits. Um, this was especially true for migratory game birds where uh, in the previous proclamation, um, season dates and bag limits were listed as, quote, specified by federal regulations, and that wasn't really clear. So we need to do something with that. Uh, additionally, we've expanded the list of, of, of uh, species of migratory game birds that can be harvested with raptors. So this is the proposed language in 1802 that we're going to add to it, um, defining the different species and their seasons. And as you can see, for a lot of the species, we were able to um, come up with some hard dates. Uh, but we did, in order to accommodate some of the language that we have for generic wording with gun hunting seasons, we had to include some generic language. Um, so for instance, you see with doves, we had to keep that generic language in order for it to correspond correctly with the gun hunters. Um, also, you'll see uh, with the rails, the moorhens, gallinules, snipe, and woodcock, these were species that were not previously allowed in, um, in, in, in the old proclamation. So we're adding a little bit more opportunity for, for the falcon, falconers. Uh, these are the... the all of the wording on, on this slide is, is new wording. We're defining what the season dates are. You can see for ducks, it completely overlaps uh, the regular gun hunting seasons, except for this last little piece where they close the last Sunday in February. Because you recall from the previous example I gave you, they get a, a few extra days, and that's how we accommodated them going to the end of February. Uh, moving on to uh, the Fur Bearer Proclamation 18-03, uh, we didn't really change much here. The only change we have is to, uh, we defined a bag limit for bobcat and raccoon. Uh, that's the only change here, but again, some housekeeping, we needed to, uh, to make these changes to the proclamation. 
Same with uh, the small game proclamation 18-04. No changes to this, just simply housekeeping. This is all the same language that we had in the previous proclamation. Um, and uh, just remind you that there's no action to be taken on any of these uh, at this point and we'll be visiting you again in May. If uh, before we go into any questions, um, something that I uh, was asked to address um, uh, back when we were talking about migratory game bird seasons uh, back in January and February, in between those two meetings, you remember I was off at the uh, flyway meeting in February, so we couldn't talk about this very much. But in between those two meetings, uh, a, a former commissioner had inquired about uh, changing the crow season to um, be more like some of our surrounding states. And by the time we got that message in and I looked into it, um, we didn't really have enough time to react to make a change uh, it, because when I started looking into it, well, there's, uh, there were several different things that were happening. We weren't sure what states um, the former commissioner was talking about. Uh, we have three states that border us that um, they have... Um, they have, they have seasons that are set up similar to ours, Arkansas, North Carolina, Virginia. They have seasons set up like ours where we do a very long season, only hunt on the weekends. Um, other states, Georgia, Mississippi, Missouri, they do a late and straight. So all of their days are consecutive at the end of the season. And then uh, one state actually has a split season on crows. So we weren't sure what the request was, but um, just I wanted to acknowledge that we're considering it and we will talk about it and uh, you know for, for next year's package when I come visit you in January of next year so so with that if there's any questions on uh, the the falconry stuff be happy to entertain that thank you Jamie yep. is there any questions from committee members mr. chairman Jamie just a quick question how many how many folks do we have to participate in this uh, I'm told that we have about 86 people right now that are currently permitted and the permits that they get are for uh, I think active for three years so thanks James Commissioner Gordon uh, yeah you mentioned that you would uh, discuss the crow issue in uh, next January but since we're on a two-year schedule does that push it to the following January or you intend on opening up a, a separate uh, just just crow only for next year wow that's a that's a good question I don't know that we've talked about that internally yet so uh, it's yeah it might be very possible that this might fall into the two-year setting process but but we we set yeah I, I, I guess I don't know I don't know at this time how we're gonna handle that so but we still have the ability to open certain sections of that up uh, regardless of the two-year requirement uh, well at um, the way it goes with migratory birds is once we report our dates to the feds, we're kind of locked in. And so for the for the 1819 season, we're locked into our seasons. We've already sent those dates to them. They're already getting them ready to, to, to post uh, in the federal register. But uh, as far as next year goes, with the feds, we have the ability to change. With the Fish and Wildlife Service, we have the ability to change our dates. It's just a matter of whether or not, you know, internally we want to, you know, how hard we want to be on sticking with that um, two-year season setting process yeah so, I just want so. to keep that in mind yeah. and, uh, and just remind that, that the initial yeah. point of, of why we did the two-year setting was that we could address specific mm -hmm. issues um, later on yeah. if in between the two-year setting if if the need arose yeah. any other committee members any questions from the public all right. Thank you, Jamie. Yeah, no problem. And with, with that, I'll uh, introduce James Kelly. He's the Deer Management Program Leader. Thank you, Jamie. As Jamie mentioned, I am the Deer Management Program Leader. Uh, in the interest of full disclosure, that is not a picture of me. That's Tennessee's favorite deer hunter, Stephen Tucker. I'm not sure how many buck of a lifetime this guy is going to be able to kill, but he, uh, he did it again this past season. So to start us off, I'm going to 
very briefly at a very high level share some of the statewide results from this past season and actually compare it to um, previous seasons back to 2005. And to evaluate our harvest, we have two different types of data. We have reported harvest and we have our, our biological data that we collect um, as staff. And I'll talk a little bit more about those as we get into it. So first, this is the reported harvest. So this is um, also known as, you know, the, the deer that were checked in by hunters. So every hunter, when they harvest a deer, are required to check in or report their harvest. I will uh, acknowledge that reporting rates, uh, research shows reporting rates, or compliance rates, uh, whatever you want to call them, do vary by geographic region, by species, species that's hunted, um, by weapon type, weapon season type, archery, muzzle, or things like that. And yeah, so I just want to acknowledge that there are limitations in reported harvest, but um, it is our best metric of how many deer are being harvested annually. And so with this graph here, I have on the x-axis or on the, the bottom part, I have the season and the season is indicating the season year. So the, for example, the 2005 season would include, you know, the deer season starting in September all the way through December and then January of, of 2006. So that would be the 2005 season and then so on throughout here. And so in pink, I have the total does reported and in blue, the total bucks reported. And as you can see, we're on a little bit of a downward trend as uh, of the past few years. And our doe harvest in the past couple of years seems to be de decreasing disproportionately uh, to buck harvest. So that's our reported harvest. That's our, again, our best measure of how many deer are being harvested. And then there's our, our biological data. And this is, whereas reported is how many, the biological data gives us the composition of, of the harvest, so, or, or the age and sex of the harvest. And here I show uh, of the males that were harvested, of the buck harvest, the age composition over time of the buck harvest. And I've grouped fawn yearlings, two and a half and three and a half year olds, and four and a half plus, as you can see by the, the legend there on the right hand side. And largely what this is showing is that there, there's a little bit of year to year variation, but there hasn't been a whole lot of changes in the age structure over time, at least not substantial changes. It's pretty, it's pretty constant. Uh, in blue there indicated the yearling, uh, the percentage of yearlings in the harvest, yearling bucks in the harvest. It's, it has de declined over time, uh, back in, in the 2005 there on the left-hand side of the graph, there, you know, we're about 40% bucks in the harvest. And around 2014, 2015 were our lowest years are for percentage of yearlings in the harvest, around 34%. Uh, and then the past two years, uh, percentage of yearlings has gone back, a slight uptick in, in percentage of yearlings in the harvest around 35 to 37 percent but still lower than back in 2005 but really not a lot of huge changes either way it's pretty it's been pretty consistent so the, again that was just some very high level results uh, statewide I'm going to continue to share some results from past seasons but I'm going to share it within the context uh, of the the antler uh, deer definition as many of you know, uh, this was changed prior to the 2016 season, and it was changed, for, pardon me one moment here, I'll get you what, what it read previously. The previous definition was male or female deer with antlers that are a minimum of three inches in length. That's, so that's what it was for all years all the way through 2015 and then beginning with the 2016 season it was visible any visible antler protruding above the hairline so just to revisit uh, this I shared this same slide last year the reason that we uh, ended up changing it prior to 2016 uh, there were a couple reasons that were cited uh, referring to bucks with greater than zero but less than three inches of antler as antlerless deer or deer that in fact had antlers as antlerless was uh, somewhat confusing for some folks to communicate that. Um, and then probably 
the primary reason or the the yeah the main rationale for for changing that was to increase protection of young bucks so to evaluate that we have two years worth of data now to, to kind of take a look at that how we did at protecting that segment and really the segment of young bucks that we're talking about are the percentage of bucks with less than three inches of antler so here is a a chart again by season and this time it's showing the percentage so no matter how you look at it this is you know a pretty small percentage of the buck harvest anyway even in um, yeah any any way you look at it you know the highest year there is around 13 percent of the harvest so it's, it's a relatively small proportion of the harvest anyway uh, but so shown in green here are all years prior you know were years where the definition was the three inch rule and shown in brown is our years when we went to the visible above the hairline rule and so just to kind of give you what's going on here oh i also want to point out the the confidence intervals the error bars on each of these let me see if i can get my pointer uh, anyone see that no Oh, wow. That's pretty slick. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, yeah. So, shown here, these are 95% confidence intervals. Uh, for the purposes of what we're discussing here today, we'll just call those the margin of error. So, if the error bars are overlapping at any point, we're not confident that there's any difference in those years. So, if you look, uh, just for example, 2010 compared to 2011, those are overlapping so we're not confident there's any difference there the only year that there was significant a statistically significant increase was in 2007 when we we don't know exactly the mechanism here but we think that was related to the statewide EHD outbreak that occurred during that year now for all ye other years pre and post there are overlapping confidence intervals so but 2016 the first year of the of the change we did see a slight reduction albeit not statistically significant but the proportion of bucks with less than three inches of antler did decline 2017 it jumped back up a little bit but again not statistically significant I will acknowledge that there again there was an EHD outbreak this year this past season actually I may have failed to to mention that when I shared the reported harvest. There was an EHD outbreak in the eastern half of the state, uh, particularly in the northern, um, northern counties. There was an EHD outbreak. So did this jump, this, might, this result might be confounded by the, the EHD outbreak that happened that, this year. So I just wanna acknowledge that. Again, no, but no statistically significant differences. When, I, when we average all the years Prior to the definition change compared to these two years with the hairline definition, there is about a 2% difference. So you could argue that the, you know, we're, we are doing a little bit of good protecting this, this segment of the population by about well, what we can see so far by about 2%. So arguably some marginal gains in protection of young bucks. But there are other um, considerations to this rule um, when this was initially proposed there was a concern about potential unintended consequences on on antlerless harvest which is primarily made up of females or, or does and so here I show three years the last three years worth of data broken out by bucks and does uh, as I mentioned earlier we are on a slight downward trend both for bucks and for does but we again are just we're it's declining um, disproportionately for does and again this was a concern that was shared by some before we changed it uh, because hunters the the rationale was um, hunters would be less confident in identifying an antlerless deer therefore more hesitant and fewer antlerless deer harvested overall 
Um, and it seems this, this result would suggest that that is indeed the case, particularly for hunters that are already, have already filled their antlered bag limit and they don't have um, any antler deer to cover any mistakes should they get up to it and, you know, they get up to their animal to recover it and there's antler protruding above the hairline. Um, they're, kind, they're in a, um, a tough situation at that point. Um, this is also true for hunters who just, who intend to fill their antler bag or just want to maintain the opportunity and don't want to, you know, risk, you know, going into their antler bag. Uh, so, again, that statewide scale, this looks like that is the case. Um, a great opportunity to, to evaluate if this is true is looking at the, the unit L antlerless only hunt where nobody has any antlered bag to cover any mistakes. Uh, 2015, we started out about um, 3,000, well, 3,278 deer were reported during that private lands antlerless only hunt. That was prior to the, that was under the three inch rule. And since changing it the past two years, the reported harvest has declined precipitously. And I have some percentages here. We're down, this year's reported harvest during that week was down about 58% from two years ago, down 41% from the previous year. So it does look like there are some the data would suggest that there are substantial impacts on antlerless harvest, which again is primarily going to be your does. So in conclusion, arguably we're, we're having a small impact on protecting young bucks. Again, we saw that uh, on average 2% decline. However, we are, it seems that we're having substantial unintended consequences on, on doe harvest. And there appear, appears to be a sentiment from the public they appear to be against the current hairline definition out of 445 people who submitted public comment. 51 of them voiced preference for returning to the three inch rule. Uh, sentiment is shared from our, our law enforcement um, division. The sentiment from the field is that hunters don't like it. And I will acknowledge that neither of those things are a scientifically valid um, human dimension survey, but that is kind of the sentiment that we're, we're hearing from the public. So because uh, the proverbial juice in terms of uh, protection of young bucks doesn't seem to be worth the squeeze, and in this case the squeeze would be on, on the doe harvest, we are, the agency recommendation is to return to the previous definition of an antler deer, which is, would be a male or female deer with antlers that are a minimum of three inches in length. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Chairman Holbert, for any questions. Thank you, James. Um, this time we'll open it up for questions from committee members. Mr. Box. Yes, I'm just curious, why the three inch? Would the two inch or one inch um, do originally what was originally planned, like as far as that, the confusion breaking the skin? You think that would be, I mean, I'm just curious why the. Uh, I, think, I think the three inch is just um, a visibility thing for for the hunters just to, you know, to make sure that they can be confident, you know, if they do make a mistake, the three, it's kind of like a, just a, a grace rule, but um, I think a, a one inch or two inch would be, would be better than, than what we are currently at. But I think that the agency recommendation and preference is, is three inch. Thank you so much. Any other committee members? Yeah, I've got a quick question. Do you have uh, that, uh, harvest data from 2000, 99, 2000, 2001? We currently, our database only, we have, the, we do have the data, but it's not compiled into all into one database. And that's one of our um, initiatives that we we're working on is to get all historic data but compiled. But not the presentation. I mean, you, you could look it up and tell what yes. the number. Yes, 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 sir. I'd like to know what the, the first, when we went to two bucks, 17 or 18 years ago, what happened to the buck harvest and what happened to the doe harvest? Just historically, that's that's the basis of of, uh, of going to two bucks to kill more does and just to kind of solidify what your data shows. The last time we did this, the doe harvest went up. And the only variable is, is this definition. So it's my understanding we went to two bucks in 2015, if 
again, this uh, predates me. I came aboard in 2016. Ben, I'm looking at you. When did we go to two bucks? I believe it was in 2015. Well, we went to two bucks in like 99 or 2000 the first time. In the 99, the book our handler book our Okay. Um, James, could you go back to the age chart? The Sir. age composition of buck harvest? Yes, yes, yes. <coughs> on, on this, where can you explain where you're getting this information from? I know we don't check in deer and you don't age every deer. Um, so, so how are you basing this, and where are you getting it from? How many deer are we actually aging? Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, so this is, these are deer that we check at processors or check stations that we set up. Um, but a lot of times we set up a check station for a day that's at a processor. But this is data that staff collects in each region. Um, each regional big game biologist coordinates collection in there. Um, their region of the state using staff and uh, most regions partner with um, university wildlife students and they're collecting age and sex data. So it's a sample of the overall harvest and I don't have the exact numbers with me. Uh, it's, it's gone down over the years due to um, staff limitations have gone down over the years or personnel, but uh, it's still several thousand deer that we're getting our hands on and we're able to Confident, we're confident in the, the age composition, and I, I will acknowledge that this is in the gun season, so this is the age comp, it's probably most representative of the age composition in muzzleloader and rifle season, not so much during, during archery season, but this is our, our best estimate of the age structure. I, just, I noticed on the two and a half and three and a half, it, it seems to be going down four and a half a little bump, but um, it seems obvious that when you look at social media or, or no matter where you look, the, the age structure, uh, you talk to taxidermists, you talk to everybody, it seems that it's going the other way, totally opposite of this chart. That's kind of, kind yeah. of mind-boggling of, of why our chart shows that the opposite when the proof <laughs> out in the field looks, it looks different. So. I just wondered, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I and th so there's a couple things that could be in play there. Maybe they don't, you know, those higher end deer don't make it to a processor or um, or a check station. They might, uh, but there are several times when a really good deer shows up um, at the processor. Uh, but it, I mean, it, it is increasing the two and a half and three and a half year old. Um, but just not substantially. So, and the four and a half plus is, you know, compared to the past several years, it is up slightly. So, so yeah, I'm not really sure how to explain that because I, I I do realize what you, what you're mentioning. Kind of um, hunters are seeing and shooting a lot more um, bigger, larger antler deer. Um, I don't know if this necessarily negates that, but it's it's not as um, marked as you as you might think when looking at it overall. So, and this and these charts can be a little misleading. I can provide a different chart to show each age class next to each other that might make it a little bit bit clearer. Okay. All right. Thanks, Jay. Any other questions from committee members? Any other committee members? Mr. Box. Is there a information that shows as far as the license decrease sales during that time period, 2016 and 17, have any correlation with analyst deer harvest? Does it show black license sales were down? It showed a difference with that as far as is it information? I don't know. Anybody know? I'll defer to Susie. Do we have that information readily available or we'll need to? 
Okay. We can get that information right. for you. Okay. Thank you so much. I'll add to that, I think you ought to look at what Commissioner Cox was saying earlier about your license sales percentages, percentages on the same chart, adding those to it, and that'd give you a correlation to be able to look and see what your correlations were in your license sales and in and, and 99, 2000 when you changed it before. I think you ought to have your license sales beside that, beside your harvest data. I think that would, I think that'd make a good chart for us to look at. Any other committee members? Any members of the public comment? I got you first. If you would come to the microphone and please state your name. I would like to remind everyone of Chairman Cook that we will be giving each person three minutes. Thank you. I understand. <laughs> here 